back to McMaster University course, Computer Science and Software Engineering 2FA3, Discrete Mathematics, and Applications 2. We're going to continue with the topic of Turing machines and computability. Last time we talked about the definition of a Turing machine, and we introduced the notion of a recursively enumerable set and a recursive set. So if we have a set A, it's recursively enumerable if it's accepted by some Turing machine, and it's recursive it's if it's accepted by a total Turing machine. A total Turing machine is a Turing machine that accepts or rejects every input. In general, Turing machines can also, in some cases, loop, so there's a third possibility. So total Turing machines don't have that possibility. Um, so we have a couple interesting uh, propositions here. The first says if A is recursive, then the complement is also recursive. This is pretty easy to show. The second is that if A and the complement are both RE, then A is recursive. This is easy to show if we use theorem 1. Theorem 1 says that if A is recursively enumerable, then there is a Turing machine that will enumerate the members of A. And the way the Turing machine works is if you take your semi-infinite tape, you run the Turing machine, and what it does is it prints out the first member, then it makes puts down a blank, then it prints out the next member, then puts out a blank, and keeps going, and it will, as long as the Turing machine is running, running it will continue to enumerate members of A. Now, a uh, decision problem of the form, does X belong to A? They, really, there's, you can, there's three possibilities. One is it's decidable, and that corresponds to A being recursive. So decidable means we get an answer of yes or no. Or it can be decidable, semi-decidable. That corresponds to A being recursively enumerable. Semi-decidable means we get a yes, possibly, but we're not guaranteed to get a no. And undecidable corresponds to A being non-recursive. That means there, there is not a Turing machine that will give us either a yes or a no. Okay, so I have a question about complements, closure of complements. The question is, which of the following statements is true? Uh, the first one is, uh, a is, if A is a regular language, then so is the complement of A. Uh, second is, if A is a deterministic context-free language, then so is the complement of A. Third is, if A is a context-free language, then so is the complement of A. If A is a context-sensitive language, then so is the complement of A. If A is a recursive language, then so is the complement of A. And if A is an RE language, and so is a complement of A. So the question is, which of these statements is true? I'll give you a moment to think about that. Okay, so welcome back. Um, we know you should definitely remember that the complements of regular languages are regular and the complements of deterministic context-free languages are also deterministic context-free languages. Their complements are the same. So we have closure here. I just mentioned that we have closure in this case. If A is recursive, then its complement is recursive. We do not have closure in this case. There are context-free languages whose complement is not context-free. An example is the language WW. That language is not context-free, but its complement is. Um, and it's also the case that if we have a recursively enumerable language, its complement may not be. Now, 
the one le left, I'm only mentioning this because it's a curious fact. The complement of a context-sensitive language is context-sensitive, but this was only recently proved in 1988. So it's a relatively new result. Okay, so let's move on. Uh, so far we've talked about Turing machines accepting language or enumerating a language. But Turing machines can also be used to compute n-ary functions like this that take n arguments and return arguments and they can either be partial or total. So we can use the Turing machines just as we defined to compute such functions. And the way we do it is we use an alphabet, our input alphabet or is of just 0 and 1, and then we represent inputs and outputs of our function using binary strings. And the start tape is n binary strings. So if we have our tape here, we have the first argument will be here, then we have a space, and the second argument. and so forth, however many arguments we have, and arguments. And then we start up the machine, and the machine, if it halts with a tape that contains a single binary string, then that single binary string represents the output of the function. Otherwise, we say the function is, is undefined. So, so if it produces more than one binary string, or if it has other stray uh, tape characters, or if it loops. In all those cases, the function is undefined. So, so it turns out, and this is theorem two, given any function, I should say any function over the natural numbers like this, if that function is computable, there is, that function will be computable if and only if there's a Turing machine that computes it. And remember what a function means to be computable. It means there's an algorithm to compute it, or another way of saying it, there's an effective method for computing. So we can use Turing machines as a model of computation for computable functions. Okay, so let's summarize a little. We have seen the use of, various uses of Turing machines. We can decide a decision procedure with the Turing machine. This here, in this case, we use a total Turing machine. We can semi-decide a decision procedure. This is when we just use a Turing machine that may not be total. It may loop. So the, so the way this Turing machine works is when we're trying to check something like X and A, it will accept it when x is an a, but when x is not an a, it will do something else. Uh, it might reject or it might just loop. So that's why it would be semi-decided semi decision procedure. And we just saw a moment ago that we can have Turing machines that compute total and partial functions. The typical way of computing a partial function is that the function loops when the value is undefined. Otherwise, it will it will produce a value on the tape and accept it. And we also talked about how you can use Turing machines to enumerate a set of values. Now there are many different versions of Turing machines that are all equivalent. They all, they all um, accept the same lang languages. They all uh, compute the same functions and so forth. Uh, but some are more convenient than others. So, in our definition of a Turing machine, our tape always starts with this end, the, the left end of marker symbol, but it's infinite this way. We could have a tape that's infinite both ways. That was what's called a two-way tape. We can have a Turing machine with multiple tapes. We can have a Turing machine with a two-dimensional tape. So one kind of two-dimensional tape would be um, an infinite array like this where we can we can write 
various spots in our infinite array. We can have multiple heads. Multiple heads are useful because often when you're writing a Turing machine, you want to do two things simultaneously. And so you want to remember where you are. So one head will be helping you do something here. Another head will be doing here. So you do something here, then you do something here and back and forth. And we can even have non-deterministic Turing machines. So there are many possibilities. Um, and like I said, there's, of all these possibilities, uh, they have been proven to be equivalent. So people who are working with Turing machines, they often shift to the kind of Turing machine that's most convenient for what they're doing. Finally, I want to leave you with a question. Um, what is the distinguishing characteristic of a modern computer? This is an important question when we look at the notion of what's called a universal Turing machine, which we'll uh, consider in our next lecture. So what is the distinguishing characteristic of a modern computer? You have four choices. Um, the, the computer can store and manipulate massive amounts of data with great speed and accuracy. It can access or control a large variety of peripheral devices, devices like mouses and keyboards and printers and so forth. It can store and run programs. It can implement, uh, it is implemented using electronic technology. So I'll give you a moment to think about this and see if you can come up with an answer. Okay, well, welcome back. Uh, modern computers can do all these things. But you can do A. You don't need to be a computer to do A. You don't need to be a computer, modern computer, to access and control a large variety of peripheral devices, nor do you need to be a computer to be implemented using electronic technology. Uh, the thing that really sets computers apart from other kinds of machines is C. Computers can store and run programs. This, this is where their power comes from. And we will, we will continue talking about this theme and see how it, is, how it is embodied in Turing machines in our next lecture. Okay, thank you very much. See you next time.